Problem three. A square piece of paper is folded in half along a line of symmetry. The resulting shape is then folded in half along a line of symmetry of the new shape. This process is repeated until n folds have been made, giving a sequence of n plus 1 shapes. If we do not distinguish between congruent shapes, find the number of possible sequences when 1, n equals 3, 2, n equals 6, and 3, n equals 9. So some of you might have spent some of the BMO1 exam folding up bits of paper. At least if you didn't, you probably did this in your mind. Let's just have a play and see what happens. So um, one square of paper, and I can fold it to make this right angle isosceles triangle. Now, once I've made that decision, I've really cut down on the lines of symmetry here. I've only got one. And so after that, I'm going to have to fold like that and carry on folding, and I'm going to get triangles all the time. So once I've made that decision at any point to fold into a triangle, then the sequence is fixed. We're going to get triangles all the way. If, however, I end up with a rectangle at any point, I've got two lines of symmetry, so I've got two options. I can make the rectangle thinner, or I can make the rectangle fatter, and sometimes when I make it fatter, it'll turn into a square. But at any point when I have a rectangle, I've got those two options, thinner rectangle or a fatter rectangle. And when we do end up with a square, you might at first think, well, that gives me lots more options because now I've got four lines of symmetry. But actually, they double up. So I either end up with my one by two rectangle or I end up back with a, with a triangle. So that gives you a feel for how this folding game is going to go. And now I'll hand over to Jeff, who's going to do the mathematics. So as Kerry has showed you, if your piece of paper is in the shape of a triangle and you fold it along the axis of symmetry, you get another one of these isosceles right-angled triangles. On the other hand, if you've got a, a rectangle or a square, there are more axes of symmetry and, and you can... Uh, you can make other things. So let's see how we might begin. This table here, somehow, it's a bit like Pascal's triangle, but it, it summarizes the state of play. Uh, let's try to explain what it means. Um, in this column, we have triangles. In this column, we have squares. And in this column, we have one by two rectangles. The different rows indicate different areas. So let's assume we start off with a piece of paper of area one, a square piece of paper. After you've done a fold, you either get an isosceles right-angled triangle, and the area has been multiplied by a half, or you get a rectangle. Ooh, the ratio of the sides is one to two. It's a one by a half rectangle. So after one fold, you are either here or here. Now what happens? Well, you do your second fold. If you had an isosceles right-angled triangle, you must fold it to another isosceles right-angled triangle. On the other hand, if you've got a 1 by 2 rectangle, you can either fold it to a 1 by 4 rectangle, or you can fold it back to a square. Of course, this square will be smaller than the original square, its area will be a quarter. And the process goes on. Now, why is this like Pascal's triangle? Well, this one here, for example, indicating you've reached a square after two folds, that comes from the possibility that you had a one by two rectangle and you folded it, and that's it. On the other hand, this isosceles right angle triangle can only have come from the one above. Let's go down further into the table and, 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 and look at a number. This five here. Right, that's counting the number of ways you can have arrived after five folds to a one by two rectangle. And that can only have arisen from a square or a 1 by 4 rectangle. And then you've done the appropriate folds. 
This 5 is 2 plus 3. This 4 is 3 plus 1. This 28 is 14 plus 14. But there's something funny going on at the left end of the table. You see, you don't just add from the right to get this 2. You add from directly above. So this is a, is a kind of special case. In the first column, you add from diagonally up and immediately above. So, for example, this 4 here is the sum of 4 and nothing. This 9 here is the sum of 4 and 5. I've written the row sums over on the right-hand side of the board over here because the row sums count exactly how many paths there are to get to that number of folds. For example, after four folds, the individual situations that you might be in are given by these, these, these numbers here. These positions have positive quantities in. But the important thing is their sum. 2 plus 2 plus 3 plus 1 is 8. So after four folds, you could have taken part in eight sequences of folds to, to, uh, to land there. And once you know that, well, the table tells you everything. After three folds, the row sum is 5. After six folds, the row sum is 24. And after nine folds, the row sum is 149. So that solves the problem. Strangely enough, there's a more efficient way to do it, writing less of the table. Because just like in Pascal's triangle, each row sum is double the previous one. It's a famous property of Pascal's triangle. That's almost true here, but not quite. What you do to get from one row sum to the next, to get from 5 to 8, is you double 5 and you subtract the first entry of the, uh, the row that ended with 5 over here. So 2 times 5 minus 2 is 8. Next, 2 times 8 is 16, but subtract the 2, 14, and so on. Now that's not magic. It's because of a very similar reason to why Pascal's triangle works, this doubling of the row sums. What's happening is that if you are in a certain position in the table, then uh, the, this number 5 is being added in to here and into here. This number 4 is being added into there and to there. That's why the row sum should be doubling. Uh, the trouble is that the first digit in a row is only making one contribution to the next row, not two. So if you double the row sum, you've counted a bit too much, and you have to subtract the first entry of the previous row. What that means is that you need a lot less data to do this calculation. I'm going to do some erasing now. So a lot of data has been erased from the board. The reason I've done that is, to, is because it's not actually necessary to perform the calculation. What you want are the row sums. Row sum when n is 3 is 5, when n is 6 is 24, and when n is 9 is 149. And you can get that by doubling the previous row sum and doing a subtraction from the entries in the first column. So the only thing you really need are the entries in the first column. And since they're constructed by this Pascal triangle type rule, uh, the stuff which is over there is not relevant. It's not going to percolate through and affect the, uh, the values of the first column. So I've just erased them. And now you're done. And we haven't even had to use a two-digit number. It's BMO1. You're in a hurry. Um, you, you, you're not on a bound to find the most efficient solution. However, if you did think of this on the fly, 
It would save you a few minutes.